everyone to Critical Conversations, Social Justice in Our Community. My name is Adrienne Finley O'Dell, and I am the head of school of Royce Moore School in Evanston. We are pleased to collaborate this evening with the Latin School of Chicago, and I am grateful to Randall Dunn, Latin's head of school and vice chair of the National Association of Independent Schools for partnering with us during this important moment. Tonight's forum was created to provide an opportunity for our school communities to come together, to acknowledge the pain that many are feeling right now, provide support, and openly address societal injustices and racism in our country. Our schools are partnering tonight to demonstrate a shared commitment to address systemic racism. We acknowledge our less than perfect pasts, and it is our desire to set forth a path for a must ju more just and equitable future. The goal tonight is to provide some context for recent events that have taken place in our country, the systemic racism that is foundational to these events, and to set the stage for future work on how we can individually and collectively work together to dismantle racism and support our young people to engage in social justice. I am deeply grateful and humbled to be sharing the virtual stage tonight, not only with Randall, but with two profoundly gifted educators who will be sharing their wisdom and insights with our community, Dr. Jonathan Holloway and Dr. Anthony Chambers. Randall and I will be introducing them in a few moments. I am even more humbled to serve our communities during this moment because as a white woman, I have never had to experience the fear or discrimination that many members of our communities have borne simply because they have black or brown skin. This is a traumatic moment and many are rightly feeling that trauma, perhaps rage, at times despair. And while George Floyd's name was referenced in the invite to this event, of course it is not to exclude the tragic deaths of Ahmaud Arbery, Breonna Taylor, and before them, Laquan McDonald and Michael Brown and others like Eric Garner, Trayvon Martin and Freddie Gray. We can keep going back to Emmett Till and thousands before him. This is a moment sparked by George Floyd's murder and hopefully it may catalyze us to real change, to wake us up to the fact that experiences of white and black and brown people in America are distinctly different. We cannot change what we cannot acknowledge and it takes commitment and community to change. Together, we can make a difference. Tonight, we lay further groundwork for our communities to do just that. Randall, I am deeply grateful for this opportunity and for you being here with us tonight. Thank you, Adrian, and welcome everyone. Um, thank you for taking the time to be here with us for this very important conversation at such a very important time. And I wanna welcome and thank all the members of the Latin community who have joined us um, this evening uh, and all the members of the Royce Moore community as well and others and friends who are here to simply engage um, in, in, in as best as we can in this format, as well as simply to hear and listen and begin a conversation that is really important now. I know that as uh, we uh, progress this evening and we look at the questions that have come in, there are a number of questions that are specific to both of our schools um, in regard to what we're doing and what is happening. I've extended the opportunity to folks to communicate directly with us. And this evening is about um, hearing from Anthony Chambers and, and Jonathan Holloway and for us to serve, have them serve as a resource for us in this really um, tragic moment. Um, as a, an African-American man who is a head of a school, it's particularly um, jolting, having been uh, a student at an independent school, to know, as we have always known, that this exists. This is an opportunity, however, for us to listen and make change. And uh, we are in that process at Latin, and as I um, will respond directly to questions that are asked of us, we are um, making plans, we're listening, and change will happen. This is a moment um, as a student of, an, of independent school, as a head of an independent school, that I'm, um, I'm genuinely and excited, frankly, to be able to engage around. This is a moment for real change, and Lions School of Chicago, certainly, and Royce Moore are in 
uh, partnership. And we need partnership and we need to be able to have through these conversations as whole independent school communities because this is happening across our country. And as vice chair for the National Association, um, I also have the opportunity to know uh, that this is happening across the country, but that many schools in uh, general partnership can make a difference and should partner to make a difference. So I wanna thank Adrienne for her leadership in pulling us together in creating um, this resource of having uh, Dr. Anthony Chambers and Dr. Jonathan Alloway, both history and the psychology of wh where this moment comes from and how we need to be able to use this moment to create true change. Um, so thank you for your leadership in recognizing this moment and bringing us together, um, Adrian, and that I really appreciate that. It's my honor to introduce Jonathan Holloway, who will um, share some words with you. And I have a difficult time calling him Jonathan because he's Dr. Jonathan Holloway, and he's about to be the president of Rutgers tomorrow, the president of Rutgers University. And I um, am excited about that moment and excited to be able to engage and hear from him. Um, and I, I will read a short bio for Dr. Jonathan Holloway, um, President Rutgers University. Uh, Jonathan Holloway specializes in post-emancipation America his, American history and black intellectual history. He was Northwestern University's provost and chief academic officer from August 2017 uh, through March 2020. Prior to that, he was the Dean of Yale College and Dean of Yale College and Edmund S. Morgan Professor of American Studies, African American Studies, History and American Studies at Yale University. He's the author of Confronting the Veil, Abram Harris Jr., E. Franklin Frazier, and Ralph Bunch, 1919 and 1941 um, in 2002. Uh, Jim Crow Wisdom, Memory and Identity in Black America since 1940 to 2013, and the Cause of Freedom, a concise history of African American, um, of African Americans. He edited Ralph Bunch's A Brief and Tentative Analysis of Negro Leadership, and co-edited Black Scholars on the Line, Race, Social Science, and American Thought in the 20th Century. He wrote an introduction for a new edition of W.B. Du Bois, Souls of Black Folk, published in 2015. He is the parent of a rising senior at Royce Moore School. It's my honor and pleasure to introduce Dr. Jonathan Holloway. Thank you so much for that introduction. Um, I'm honored to be here. Uh, this is quite a moment in our nation. Um, uh, please pardon my background, by the way. I just moved into my house a day and a half, two days ago and things are a little bit chaotic. And maybe that's some sort of metaphor for the moment. There's a lot of chaos going on in our society, but I, I choose to be very um, hopeful. Um, I feel that's my only choice, frankly. If I were to be caught up only in despair, uh, I wouldn't be able to get out of bed in the day, uh, every day. And I mean that quite seriously. Uh, we need to take advantage of this moment uh, this incredible opportunity placed in front of us to do better and to be better. When Adrian reached out to me in the first place as a member of the Royce Moore community, wanting to know my thoughts and if I could contribute in some way, she asked if I would um, spend some time talking about how we got to this moment. I'm a historian by training, and so her thinking was, what, what can you tell us from the standpoint of African American history, American history, about how we got here? And I facetiously said, oh, so over 400 years of history in five minutes, right? Um, that's what I'm going to try to do. The fact is, uh, as I hope all of you understand, the terrible incidents that we've seen most um, recently over the last six weeks or so, uh, this isn't new. This just isn't new. What has changed really in the last decade, and that's about the length of time that it's changed, um, are these smartphones in which everybody is a journalist and people are cataloging incidents of uh, state sanctioned violence or extrajudicial violence in the case of a um, young man who was uh, murdered while jogging in a neighborhood. Uh, the cataloging of the daily challenges that so many people, black people, brown people, poor people, 
people who don't speak English as a first language, uh, we now know way more than we ever did before. And it's unsettling. Um, what I, so I want to start from there. This is not new. The question is now, what are we going to do with it? And for me, especially as we're in an election year, I think it's important that we think about fundamental aspects of what it means to be an American citizen, what citizenship is all about. And in order to do that, we need to go back to our founding documents. I encourage all of you to take the time to visit the Constitution, well, the Declaration of Independence, the Constitution, the Bill of Rights. Um, it's pretty easy to find all of those documents and look in those documents and try to understand if we have lived up to the promise in those documents? The answer is no, we just haven't. If we start from the standpoint of being born in this country makes you a citizen of this country, who gets to claim the rights of full citizenship? Who gets the benefit of the presumption of belonging in the first place? It is not evenly applied. Now, I don't wanna turn this into a rant or anything like that, although I don't see it that way. I want to take you to a, a very specific moment. This is um, the night before the uh, uh, Montgomery bus boycott, it, what would become sort of the height of the modern civil rights movement. And a minister, Martin Luther King Jr., new to Montgomery and very reluctant, didn't want to get involved at all, was essentially forced to the podium and he was going to become the sacrificial lamb because no one thought this thing was going to work the sacrificial lamb for the movement. And at a very key moment in his speech, and I'm, I'm afraid I'm not gonna quote it with every word exactly right, but it's a close paraphrase. He talks to the marshes and says, tries to reassure them that we are not wrong in what we are doing. If we are wrong, he says, if we are wrong, the constitution of the United States is wrong. If we are wrong, the Supreme Court of this nation is wrong. If we are wrong, God Almighty is wrong. If we are wrong, Jesus of Nazareth was merely a utopian dreamer who never came down to earth. And he goes on from there. Those four moments are articulated in an order that is very important. The Constitution, the Supreme Court, then, remember he's a third generation minister, then God, then Jesus. For me, in that moment, King was saying, we need to have faith in the Constitution. We need to invest our energy in that, because that is the thing that guarantees us citizenship. We need to have faith in the Supreme Court, because it is now interpreting. Brown versus the Board of Education had just been decided a year earlier. It is now interpret, interpreting the rights of citizenship in a way that gives hope to the African-American experience, or African-Americans. So he starts there, and then he goes into his religious training. I say this to emphasize the fact that, and this is now 40, what, 45 years ago, someone who's known for his religious orientation becoming a political uh, leader, at the moment of his emergence on the scene, what is he calling for? He's calling for something deeply conservative. Let's abide by the founding document of this country. Let's abide by a powerful institution in this country whose job it is to interpret that document. This is about let's actually live up to the ideals of our country. Let's live up to what has been promised to every citizen in this country. And if we do just that, what a great country this can actually be. Those founding documents are remarkable. They had, they, they, they had ne nothing like that had existed prior to that moment in the world. It's this grand experiment. The documents are great. Our success in adhering to the documents leaves a lot to be desired. I'll close with this one comment that um, uh, a current activist said, and, and forgive me, I, I I think her name is Kimberly Jones, and I apologize if I have that wrong. She has this powerful video that really um, captured on video that, that really gives you 400 years of history in about five minutes. And she ends with the observation as she's trying to help people understand why people would take such radical actions as destroying property. 
and, and she says, people should be grateful that black folks are merely looking for justice and not revenge. King was looking for justice in the lines of our great founding documents, not revenge. We need to recognize this moment as a moment to inform everybody that this country in its organizing logic is remarkable, but it has to deliver on its promise because someday people might come for revenge, not just for justice. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jonathan. That was uh, so helpful in giving us context for thinking about the moment we're experiencing right now. I loved that thought from uh, Martin Luther King, if we are wrong, the Constitution is wrong, and how it calls upon us all to be better citizens and engaged citizens. And we are exploring tonight how we can encourage our communities to really step up for social justice. To provide more thoughts for us in this moment in terms of the trauma that some of our communities are feeling, we've invited Dr. Anthony Chambers to speak with us. And I'm going to share with you his bio and uh, let you learn for yourself what an amazing person he is. Dr. Anthony Chambers is the Chief Academic Officer and a licensed clinical psychologist on staff at the Family Institute at Northwestern University. Dr. Chambers is also the Director for Northwestern University's Center for Applied Psychological and Family Studies and is a clinical professor in the Department of Psychology. Dr. Chambers is one of the few psychologists and only African-American male psychologist nationwide board certified in treating couples. Dr. Chambers is also a former president and first African-American male of the American Psychological Association Society for Couple and Family Psychology. He is also the current president for the American Academy of Couple and Fi Family Psychology and first African-American, which is one of the two organizations involved in board certifications for psychologists in couple and family psychology. Finally, Dr. Chambers was recently elected to the Board of Directors for the American Psychological Association. Dr. Chambers received his undergraduate degree in psychology from Hampton University, which is a historically black college and university, and completed his MA and PhD in clinical psychology from the University of Virginia. He completed his internship and postdoctoral clinical residency at Harvard Medical School and Massachusetts General Hospital. Dr. Chambers was also the Dr. John J.B. Morgan Postdoctoral Fellow at the Family Institute at Northwestern. Dr. Chambers' professional accomplishments have resulted in becoming a Fellow of the American Psychological Association, a Fellow of the American Academy of Couple and Family Psychology, and a diplomat of the American Board of Couple and Family Psychology. Dr. Chambers has served on the Board of Directors of several scientific journals as well. He is currently serving fortunate to us at Royce Moore as the vice chair of the board of trustees and he is an avid reader of all things surrounding private school education. Having graduated as a lifer, which ranged age three to 18 from the University School of Milwaukee, a prominent private school 20 minutes north of Milwaukee, he has experienced firsthand the benefits of receiving a private school education as well as the challenges of being one of the only African American students in a wealthy predominantly white institution. Dr. Chambers' most proud achievement is that he has been happily married for nearly 20 years and has a beautiful seven-year-old daughter. On a personal note, I will add that I am proud and honored to call Dr. Chambers a friend and that he is at once one of the most insightfully intelligent and compassionate individuals that I know. And he, he's able to maintain that even in the midst of working in incredibly long hours, much longer than uh, even a head of school serves. So I am delighted and thrilled to introduce you to Dr. Anthony Chambers. 
Wow, with that kind of introduction, I hope I can uh, live up to this. Thank you so much, Adrian. And of course, the feelings are 100% uh, mutual. Um, hello, everyone. Um, it is my great honor uh, to participate in this critically important conversation tonight about social justice in our community. I am overwhelmed with hope and pride but with the extraordinary turnout that we've had tonight. Um, 2020, to say that it has presented many obstacles would be an understatement. First, of course, there was the COVID-19. For the past several months, we have witnessed this virus change. One of our most fundamental needs, which is human connection. COVID-19 has impacted every facet of our lives, from the economy to increases in mental health challenges. Then, just as we started to reopen society, the United States of America and the world were reminded that in addition to COVID-19, we are still dealing with another virus the virus of racism. It has been 401 years, and unfortunately, we are still experiencing the historical and systemic manifestations of racism. Last month, the world witnessed another black man dying at the hands of police brutality. However, however for some reason, this one has seemed different. Um, part of it, I think, is maybe because of the timing. For nearly four months, we have been sheltering in place. So I think there was a lot of pent up energy that allowed people to galvanize into doing the protest. I also think that the fact that we've had fewer distractions, uh, such as the absence of sporting events and movies. Thus, the death of George Floyd received unprecedented and focused attention, which has allowed us to absorb this even more. However, I think there is also another reason for why this has been so impactful a psychological reason. I believe the emotional potency of this moment is a direct result of the fact that we did not witness a murder. We witnessed a lynching. For nine minutes, George Floyd was being lynched while bystanders were helpless to do anything. Witnessing a lynching, a lynching has an emotional intensity that is above and beyond other forms of violence, which is why this has been so hard for us to process. Moreover, the helplessness of the bystanders and the vulnerability of George Floyd felt is really the isomorphic to the collective pain that we are experiencing across the globe. In 1776, Thomas Jefferson wrote the phrase, all men are created equal as part of the Declaration of Independence. And now in 2020, many individuals from the dominant culture witnessed the limitations of that sentiment. It has caused many to begin their own journey towards deeper understanding and connection with those who are different from them. For many Blacks, however, the death of George Floyd is unfortunately anything but surprising. He was just the latest in a long line of African-American men who have died at the hands of the police. Although we are not surprised, we are still definitely impacted. One of the important ways this impacts us psychologically is that we are reminded of the limitations of our own PPE in combating this racism virus. I would venture to say that there is not a successful African American, nor is there an African American student who has attended an elite private school who hasn't learned that before you walk into work or walk into school, that you have to put on your personal protective equipment. That equipment includes being mindful of your hair, especially for black women, being mindful of how we talk, how we dress, how to look non-threatening, and how to code switch. We live with that every day in what is sometimes referred to as the black tax. It is the price that we pay for being black in this society. We are so used to doing it that it is automatic, but it also takes a toll especially on our students. I am on the board of the American Psychological Association, as Adrian mentioned, and in that role, I also work closely with our Board of Educational Affairs. In that capacity, I am helping to oversee a newly created task force examining what the research tells us about ethnic and racial disparities in pre-K to 12th grade education. I don't believe you will be able to fully understand and address these disparities without accounting for the psychological impact of the black tax. Again, the death of, de of George Floyd was just one more reminder of the fatal limitations 
of our PPE in combating this racism virus. There is no question that America is dealing with two crises in COVID-19 and racism. However, I firmly believe that you should never let a good crisis go to waste. This moment presents the opportunity for us all to get in touch with our own feelings of helplessness and vulnerability in order to help us connect with our own humanity. It is through connecting with those raw emotions that everyone has felt at some point in their life that we will be able to increase our capacity to identify and transform our empathy into healing. Identifying our shared humanity is at the heart of empathy. It is not until we move beyond this solely being a quote unquote black problem, but rather understand that we witnessed a crime against humanity. It is only through the recognition that we will begin to see the kind of change that is required for long lasting healing. To everyone, but especially to our students that we have here in the audience who are filled with rage, confusion, and sorrow, I encourage you to use your knowledge and skills to facilitate healing. I hope that this moment ignites your passion and resolve to put a stop to injustice. I hope that you use this moment to submit your drive to lead a purpose-driven life that helps to solve the most complex problems of our time. Buddhists often say that, quote, life is inevitably challenging and how we are going to do it in a way that's wise and doesn't complicate it more than it is just by itself is the goal. I think there is a lot of wisdom in that as it pertains to the human condition and how we live. Yes, the death of George Floyd is about police brutality, but it is about so much more. It is a metaphor for the insidious and systemic nature of this racism virus. The death of George, of George Floyd and the subsequent protests are a metaphor for injustice. And what brings me hope is that the protesters come from every walk of life. We are witnessing a multicultural coalition of citizens standing up for justice. This is what provides me hope. Royce Moore and Ladin are fundamentally learning organizations, which means that we will make mistakes and that we are not perfect. But I am hopeful that this crisis becomes a watershed moment for not only the educational institutions, but for society as a whole, as we seek to move the needle closer towards healing. Institutions of education are about creating the right environment for true learning to happen. In the film, Won't You Be My Neighbor, which documents the storied history of Fred Rogers, Mr. Rogers said, quote, the most important learning is the ability to accept and expect mistakes. That sentiment was echoed by Dr. Steve Marboli when he said that, quote, life doesn't get easier or more forgiving. We get stronger and more resilient. Thus, helping our students and ourselves to embrace the uncertainty that life brings and helping students to respond with grace is one of the most powerful gifts we can give them. So students realize that graduation is not the pinnacle of your learning, but rather graduation represents the start of a new phase of lifelong learning. As I mentioned earlier, Royce Moore and Latin are fundamentally learning institutions, which means that we will make mistakes and that we are not perfect. In fact, it is, it is the experiences of students who help to hold us accountable to evolve and become the best version of ourselves. It is the youth who have left an indelible mark on our country. As Vice Chair of Royce Moore, I'm committed to ensuring that the legacy of each graduating class is one of progress. I want to ensure that the 2020 represents an inflection point of accelerated growth in terms of equity, diversity, and inclusion. 2020 clearly represents change, and no meaningful change in our history has ever come without strife and sacrifice. I know that Royce Moore and Latin are committed to ensuring that our actions are fully aligned with our values and intent. We must embrace a growth mindset as we strive towards becoming the best version of ourselves. In closing, I would like to end with an African proverb that I think helps to put, to contextualize the protests that we have been witnessing. And I think proffers some interesting food for thought. The child who is not embraced by the village will burn it down to feel its warmth. Thank you, everyone. Anthony, thank you so much for such thoughtful words uh, for us all to ponder. And there's 
uh, so much for us to be working toward as a community, uh, as communities of uh, higher education for some of us for K-12 education uh, so that we truly advance the work that needs to be done, that we all must dig in and must happen together. I am excited now to move on to the next phase of tonight's uh, program, and that is to address some questions that uh, you all have on your minds. There were a lot of questions that were submitted in advance, and what we are going to do is we've picked out a few of them that were um, prepared to go ahead and start talking through, but there may be more questions that are on your minds that you'd like to put in the Q&A. If we run out of time before we finish today, we're going to gather all of those questions and work to address them uh, separately after tonight's event, because tonight is just the beginning of what we hope are ongoing conversations at our communities at every level. Um, so I'm gonna start with the first question. And this one I'm gonna to pose to Dr. Holloway first. The question is, during my tenure through grad school, I experienced so-called racism from students and faculty, name calling in an empty classroom, academic disagreement resulting in judgmental grades, the only fail of my whole career in higher learning. I even helped my children navigate issues a generation later. How do academic institutions evolve from reactive to supportive? Some of my most challenging times were events that took place outside of the classroom. Uh, thank you, Adrian. That's a, there's a lot in that question. Um, I want to focus on that part about institutions. How can they be more proactive than reactive, I think was the, the phrasing. Um, I, I really do believe that uh, institutions and the Boulder well, leaders need um, to be the most authentic listeners that they possibly can. Uh, I've, I've referred to Rutgers where I'll take the helm tomorrow as a beloved community, which is 100,000 people. It's too big to, I mean, I'll never know everybody there, but I know that there are many different types of people that are functioning to make sure that Rutgers operates. That it's not just about students it's, or just about faculty, but it's about bus drivers and sanitation workers and you know, plumbers and all that sort of thing. We need to make sure if we're leading an institution that we make an effort to know all the different types of people in our community and recognize that they have different experiences. And we need to make sure all the other members of our community recognize that complexity as well. Uh, that means you need to shelve your ego at times. There's no doubt about that. Um, recognize that as a leader, you're actually a servant and um, that you need to signal in your words and in your deeds that no matter what position a person occupies in the organization, they are important and they have value. Um, and it's really, just, frankly, just small gestures of acknowledgement, I think, are huge difference makers within institutions. So if I, could, if I had a wand and I could you know, make um, institutional leaders um, mindful of that phenomenon, I think institutions would be much more receptive and tuned in to the kind of dynamic that um, so negatively colored the person who asked the question, that person's experience. And I think you can mitigate a lot of that pain up front simply by acknowledging the people around you and acknowledging all of their complexities as well. Yeah, very well said. Very well said. Yeah, that, yeah I, I was, um, I would add also just, uh, you know, the question about reactive and uh, versus supportive and the trajectory that institutions, um, predominantly white institutions in particular have to be able to strengthen the opportunity to, to be proactive. Um, but you, you also need to strengthen the muscle that you need when you need to be reactive as well. Um, I think the combination of being able to do both, um, both things is really important um, because that in itself, the, 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 the ability to react and be proactive builds a muscle that allows the support, um, as you talked about, Jonathan, to exist. The, the sense that you understand what it means um, for the individuals in your institution that you are 
um, showing both of those sides is a really important thing for us to do. Um, okay, I, will, I, I will also, I'm sorry. No, I have, I have a ne the next question, but go ahead, you can answer this. Oh yeah, well, I was gonna, uh, the other part I was just gonna say is that um, to me as leaders, I think what both um, Randall and Jonathan said, I think it's spot on. Um, to me, it's really about for leaders to be able to have compassion, to be able to hold humility, and to be able to communicate. Um, you know, and that last one sometimes I think gets uh, underutilized, but the importance of being able to be proactive and to be able to respond intentionally and timely, I think it's really an important piece uh, to all of this. And for us to be able to take this moment as a leader in an organization to realize too that we are learning organizations, like I mentioned in the remarks I mentioned. Um, you have to embrace this growth mindset, which means you have to be willing as a leader to accept that we're not perfect and it's an opportunity to receive feedback to be able to become a better version of ourselves. Um, and I think it's through that iterative process and a commitment to sustain that level of intentionality that institutions begin to transform and evolve uh, to becoming uh, a place where everyone is feeling supported and able to provide, uh, perform the best to their abilities. Yeah. Thank we, you, Anthony. We each want to be known, right? We each want to, we want each want to be known, be seen, be valued for who we are as individuals. And, you know, the comment that you made in your statement, Anthony, about wearing the PPE, like how awful it must feel to feel like you have to wear a PPE when you're coming into school each day, right? So we need to make our schools, our environments safe places where everyone coming onto our campuses feels like they can be themselves and appreciated for who they are. So next question is uh, um, for Jonathan or for, um, Jonathan, the optics around reforming institutions, mostly policing, but also education has been inflammatory uh, to many. How do you frame the language of change to be inclusive yet effective? For instance, defund the police has sparked heated debate, which is a way in which to draw attention to much needed reform. That's a really good question. Um, uh, so, um, as Adrian said in my introduction, I'll become president of Rutgers tomorrow. And I sent out a, a, a message will be, you're getting a preview because it gets released tomorrow morning. Uh, I made the conscious decision to include the phrase Black Lives Matter in my, in my welcoming comments, saying that we had an opportunity now, given everything that's going on, to take phrases like social justice and Black Lives Matter and help people realize they are not assaults on the common good they're actually requests or claims on those founding documents, going back to what I was saying earlier. Defund the police is very catchy, okay? And there's a long history of, of let's put it, I'll be polite, a fraught relationship between many parts of the black and brown communities or immigrant communities and police forces. I hope we understand this to be a true statement. And this is not an anti-police statement. Actually, I, I really admire a lot of our first responders um, but we can't ignore the fact that there are real problems. Defund the police is catchy in our socially um, mediated world that really seems to want to get to serve as clickbait to get people worked up and agitated. It works. But for me, I get concerned when something is so catchy that it just antagonizes other people who might have been allies. We've seen the way that, I mean, I knew that by putting a Black Lives Matter in my opening statement, I will get angry emails tomorrow. I'm sure of it. And they will have entirely missed the point. The people who are upset by hearing defund the police are for the most part missing the point of what most people are talking about when they, when they talk about defund the police. They're talking about reallocating resources so that you might have more money going to libraries or public schools or things like that. That seems like a reasonable conversation to have. Unfortunately, using this kind of language makes it very hard to get to the table where people can talk in the first place. Now, I'm saying this in full recognition of the fact that the only way people have gotten to the table in the past is by making radical demands on society, which breaks my heart that it would take that much just to be recognized as a citizen. Um, so I think, you know, we need to have that, those kinds of 
that language that pushes the envelope that makes people uncomfortable with the hope that there's another population, another voice coming through that's also saying, okay, we've got your attention. Let's talk about the nuances of this. Let's talk about the complexities of this because nothing is as simple as anything social media generates in this world today. Nothing is that simple. Thanks, Jonathan. You know, as you were talking about that, it made me think of, you know, Malcolm and Martin and the need for both of those contexts at the same time to move the conversation forward to advance social justice. And I think that's where we are today as well with the need for both threads of thought and discussion to really make a difference. And I just want to add one thing that I, I really love what Jonathan just said, and I hope that everyone that's listening is able to take to heart what he's putting out there. And there's a point that I just want to punctuate, um, which is the whole idea of discomfort. You know, change by definition means there's a period of feeling uncomfortable. If you, you would, I would argue that if you're not feeling some degree of discomfort, there really isn't change happening. Um, and so sometimes we're using language intentionally to be able to provide some of that discomfort to get the attention of the structural constraints that are currently in our society that are really there to preserve the status quo. Um, and you know, none of us um, as individuals or even as larger systems really are, uh, we tend to be fairly resistant to change. And so change happens when we sometimes get to a place of feeling some of that discomfort. So I think that's another just uh, contextual psychological perspective uh, to that question. I think it's a very good one. Yeah, thank you, Anthony. Very well said. I'm gonna switch to the next question. And I think this is for Randall and me primarily, but Jonathan and Anthony might have something to add uh, with the representation of educational institutions that they represent. Uh, the question is, how do we as a school and institution facilitate the diversification of the teaching staff in a way that makes sense to the school, but that also allows for social justice as a central pillar of our values? That's a uh, good question. And you know, one that I, I think uh, so many schools have struggled with, and the question is why, 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 where's that struggle coming in and what are the mistakes that are being made there? I do think in our institutions, um, the subtlety uh, around the hiring process, the subtleties in terms of who's making the hire, who's making the call, what systems you have in place, um, come to bear on the makeup eventually of the faculty. And I think all of our schools have lots of work to do in being conscious of our process. Um, process in terms of hiring, um, where the department, who the department chair is, what kind of training folks have, what kind of process goes into vetting resumes that um, will be able to um, allow folks to um, be looked at in a fair and equal way. And, you know, I think in addition to uh, the, the the aligning of process, as well as um, being, being sure to be able to search far and wide and to create policies that hold you accountable for um, creating uh, a diverse faculty. Um, now, uh, you know, I, I think one of, the, one of the really hard things in this moment is for us as a school and as independent schools to really look at this issue and to really um, Make, pick no bones about, um, you know, I think there are times where people are trying to avoid quotas or we don't want to do, I think the time has come to say, listen, it's time for us to actually consciously um, throw those out the window and really consciously create policy and processes that align with this particular part of the values that we all say we have in our school. We, we're going to have to make this, I think, coming out of this, um, many of our schools, I hope, will really look at this issue in a very conscious way, not picking any bones about the fact that we need to di diversify our faculty and make conscious choices and, and keep ourselves accountable as the years um, come upon us. So I think it's the consciousness and also how broadly we, there are schools that limit, you know, where they look and the, the sort of outreach and using folks. Um, I think that's really important. I also think um, finally, the retention of faculty is, um, is oftentimes where many of our schools fall down. 
um, the, the creating the culture. And that's what is happening right now is the cultures of our school need to change in order for folks to stay. Um, once you hire faculty of color, being able to put in place um, uh, ways to support uh, faculty of color, way, ways for them to be heard, way, ways for them to um, find themselves in your institution and also progress in your institution are really important aspects of what will make a difference. Yeah, those, that's all very, very true, very well said. Randall and I know uh, you guys have done a lot of work at Latin in that regard and you know at Royce Moore we have a lot of work to do there uh, as well it's a, a challenge for a small school uh, that doesn't have the resources that some larger institutions have in a competitive employment landscape when not as many people are going into the teaching profession so I think another aspect to this is really encouraging young people to consider teaching as a profession and what a noble profession it is, and then to find the resources to support them. And um, we know all too well that uh, our faculty are not paid uh, what they could earn in other places. And uh, they are here because they love children. They, they love inspiring and changing lives. Uh, it's not about the paycheck, but yet they do deserve a living paycheck. And so therein lies some of the challenge that uh, all of our schools find is being able to support the um, you know, living wages and benefits for people who, quite frankly, have some of the biggest impact on young people's lives than anybody else in their lives other than their mom and dad. We need to be able to find a way to prioritize that uh, as a society for teachers uh, to make sure that we can attract more people into this profession. Yeah, I would, I would support everything that was uh, just said by both you, Adrian and Randall. I mean, I think the, um, you know, there's not an, an administrator out there who doesn't think very a lot about how do you hire. Um, right, the whole adage that you know, how do you hire well and hire slow, but sometimes you have to let people go uh, more quickly uh, with that. That in the ministry, you really have to think about uh, the culture that you're trying to create and how does this person fit into that culture. I think one of the most insidious ways where biases can come into place is really when um, it really comes down to the the definition of success. What does a good applicant really look like? And sometimes inherent in our definition about how we think about what would a successful faculty member be or a staff member, what have you. There are sometimes biases that all actually within our definition um, of that. And I think we have to then take a critical look at how we are defining success in this way and what are we really trying to do. And that takes a lot of intentionality. And I think it really involves bringing in all of the key constituents to help really make sure that there are the right people at the table to help formulate that definition and really help to then guide uh, that process in a thoughtful way. That's great. Thank you for that. And um, the next question for, um, for you, Anthony, um, during the time of slavery, the entire body politic were witnesses to horrific state permissible violence, and they lived under a constant threat of terrifying violence. It is reasonable to assume that white Americans who lived through slavery also suffered from post-traumatic stress disorder and adopted coping mechanisms that might last generation. If so, can you reflect on how a PTSD sufferer uh, um, and their descendants, even until this day, might go about making governing decisions and implementing social policies related to race. So jam packed. It's, it's jam packed. It's a very thoughtful question uh, with a lot of different layers. Um, even coming down to the idea of using PTSD, which I think using it in this way provides a nuanced way of beginning to think about it. Um, and I think the idea of trauma um, is a real important piece and really salient to this conversation. And I would even go so far as perhaps even with COVID-19, I think some of the, I think the next epidemic to some degree that our first line responders are going to be experiencing is the, uh, PTSD. <clears throat> the kind of trauma of having to be on the front line and responding uh, to this virus. 
But then, you know, there are literally, you know, hundreds of thousands of African American men today who are struggling with PTSD because of traumatic experiences that they have had with the police. There is uh, nothing more than really feeling your, the vulnerability of feeling of having someone in power and not knowing where this is going to go. I mean, the profound psychological impact of that moment, even when you are actually able to survive that moment, um, leaves an indelible mark on your psyche and how you go about your safety, how you view safety. It goes back to the PPE um, and the limits of that that I was mentioning. Um, I think that there's a lot that sort of uh, within that. And I do think, as, as the question I think was getting at too, there's an intergenerational sort of pattern that can happen um, of not only trauma, but I would go so far as kind of what I think the, uh, the author of that question was suggesting, even coping. Um, I think that, you know, the flip side of trauma is resilience. Um, and I would argue that one of the things that have been really important to the African American community is our oral history of storytelling. Um, and I think that storytelling has really done and has played an important role of being able to create uh, resiliency for how do you go about handling and navigating uh, different situations, um, including with the police. There is probably not uh, an African American parent out there uh, who has a son and I think actually now they even was, uh, was a daughter who is having some conversation about what do you do when you are confronted with the police and making sure that you survive that incident. Um, and that comes from, again, part of that, uh, the history of storytelling and that's been part of our resilience um, as a people. Um, the other, the last part of that question, I think, though, is also about what do you do with it and how do you begin to turn, you know, really sort of PTSD or trauma, uh, which is really sort of has a victim, you know, sort of label connotation attached to it, to one of empowerment. Um, and I think part of what you have to do is to be able to hopefully use some of those unfortunate traumatic experiences and turn them into an opportunity to live a purpose-driven life where you are now finding ways to be able to stand up for some of the injustices, to be able to not feel like that you are just having to have life happen to you, but you can actually get plugged in, whether it's with voting, whether it's with uh, being able to be involved in a not-for-profit aligned with your interest, um, whether it's maybe giving, getting involved in politics, whether you know, including local politics um, at, the, from, at the school board level uh, for individuals, being involved in trying to get involved in different committees, that there's a way that you can use that experience that I think provides an important voice to when the key decisions have to get made at our different institutions. And so I think that there's a, um, a lot in there. Thank you, Anthony. Your mention of voting uh, brings to mention our next question. Uh, with the election in November, tensions can already be high at our schools. As educators, how do we continue to have important conversations about race, anti-racism, and Black Lives Matter when some students and families perceive these as political? Well, I'll just jump in very quickly. I've been talking a lot about uh, founding documents and such, and actually a question came in about, you know, pointing out these documents are not perfect. No, they're actually quite flawed as our founding documents, but we haven't even reached the basics of our, of our original documents. Um, so I, I think it's important to recognize um, from a college perspective that we have new voters. In fact, in this fall's presidential election, most of the students will be undergrads will be voting for the first time in their lives. So people, uh, parents and administrators of, of that age population need to be mindful about how to help these new voters understand the deep responsibility of this moment and the, the civics of this moment. This is not about political party. This is not about which candidate you prefer. This is about the importance of the act uh, that people have fought for and died for. Um, the act of having your voice count. And it's not just at the presidential election. Anthony mentioned local. I mean, local is maybe more important, frankly. And I think um, from a, a on-campus perspective, one of the you know one of the conversations we've been having since the last election is about um, the civil discourse in our schools and and revisiting that notion of civil discourse. And I think it's gotten um, to be spun as a way for white conservative families to hear their voices. And many people have sort of turned their back on the notion of civil discourse. And I think there's a practice about um, being able to educate kids about having conversations. I think one thing 
that being on the computer, being in your own world and tunnel has taken away um, uh, the, or diminished the skills of, of kids to have conversations. And they are so busy curating, you know, our kids sometimes get caught um, and the kids in the, who are watching can admit, you get caught curating who you are and, and listening, um, we all as a country begin to listen to one voice. And the importance of curating conversation on our campus, um, uh, civil discourse as a practice is a really important thing to revisit and to, to shed the notion that it's only for one side of um, the conversation. People need to, we need to be able to be aggressive in teaching the adults to teach kids. And I think we start with the adults because it's sometimes difficult for teachers to, um, to, to teach kids how to do this properly, to hear the other side, to share your own story, and for kids to receive both. And I think um, we are actually in a generation where there are a lot of kids who are demanding schools do a better job of educating them about the various perspectives. I think that's a really important moment for us to, to not um, stare away from civil discourse, but really enhance our approach and make sure that it's, a, it's an important part of our community. And I know I say something. Oh. Uh, just very quickly, I completely agree. And I want to emphasize that discourse does not mean you agree with each other. Disagreement is actually fundamental to being a good citizen. But people have seemed to have lost the wisdom of how to disagree. Yeah, and I would absolutely agree with both those points. And just really quickly, I would just say that human decency is not political um, at the end of the day. Um, and I think that's what this is all about. Great. Um, do we have time for this last question? <laughs> Should we, we can, go there? We can make time for one last question. One this last is question. a, a okay. pre-submitted question, and I apologize that we're going to run out of time for all of the other ones um, that people are posting, but uh, we'll deal with those in our own communities, I suppose, yeah? Sure. All right, go Yes, ahead. definitely. All right, are private schools inherently racist? Can inclusivity really exist in a place that, by definition, excludes many students because they cannot afford tuition or because they lack the resources to present themselves as quote unquote qualified. Um, that question, uh, absolutely um, a great question for this moment. And I think the thing I would start with in there is the notion that, um, it, that it is asked that by definition, our schools um, exclude many students. And I think that term by definition is the thing that we need to focus on in this moment because we have to actually change the definition of what our schools um, historically, and you know, uh, Dr. Holloway being here, knowing history means a lot. And sometimes it is, sometimes when we think we have even gotten away from our history, the hidden aspects of it psychologically, as Dr. Chambers might have even um, talked to us about, is, is there. And we have to really work hard to listen and to examine our, our practices um, both institutionally and on the ground in the student culture in particular, to redefine those cultures. Um, that redefinition is a really, um, really, it's, it's, it's a, it, it is what the moment we're in right now, this notion of redefinition. Um, and, and it cannot be, it can, will continue to be racist until we really examine that definition and that history. And I, I would say, uh, a huge aspect to our schools is the access question. Uh, you know, clearly, you know, it, we are not public. It, it, there's a fee to be able to attend our schools, um, but there's a fee in other ways to attend public schools. It's just sourced differently, one through taxes, the other through um, people paying who want something uh, different from what they could get at a, a public institution where they're paying through taxes. Um, but for those institutions that are tuition-based institutions like ours, we have to work really, really hard to make our schools as accessible as possible to diverse populations. And uh, that is a struggle. Uh, to make the finances work. Um, a lot of things do come back to making those finances work. 
Um, a lot of um, people have a misperception um, about independent schools having loads and loads of money. Well, sometimes people with loads and loads of money send their kids to independent schools, but that doesn't necessarily translate to mean that there are big budgets at, at independent schools. Um, I can speak to that at Royce Moore, um, but still there should be a strong commitment. If you want to have an experience for all of your students that is inclusive and welcoming, you need to find ways to um, make a commitment economically to ensure that you have diversity in every way that you can. And um, I think that that is one of the big, big challenges for independent schools today who not, you know, not just independent schools, but colleges too, you know, trying to make school affordable and accessible. Uh, you know, just as in the college side where colleges have, you know, in, in many cases priced themselves out of the market that has happened at independent schools across the country as well. And so we, we have to think about additional models, financial models to be sustainable and accessible to as many as possible. Great. Well, folks, we are past our 8 p.m. Uh, time. I want to thank everyone for being a part of the conversation tonight and especially Dr. Chambers and Dr. Holloway for sharing your wisdom with us. We are so grateful to have uh, the opportunity to have you join us tonight. And Dr. Holloway, we wish you the best as you begin your tenure at Rutgers. We are thrilled for you with this opportunity and uh, we look forward to seeing you back here in Evanston often to visit. And our, our friends at Latin, Thank you for joining us, Randall. Thank you for being a partner. Thank you, Adrian. Look forward to our further conversations. Great. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks, everyone. Yes, thanks so much. Everybody, good night. <laughs>